Today, we're going to talk about two different, two different areas. First, we did a study in Philadelphia, as Jesse has referred to, looking at uh, the capitalization of 150 organizations. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about what we learned. Then we're going to talk to you about how capitalization can work for you and how to develop a strategy about how to capitalize your organizations based on all the lessons we learned. Okay, so first, the study. We worked with the Pew Charitable Trusts in Philadelphia and the William Penn Foundation, and they asked us to look at 150 of their organizations over time. They were worried because after investing in financial health, long-term planning, financial TA, new program development, a whole host of things that they hoped would strengthen the organizations, they didn't think they were in good financial health. In fact, some of them they thought were worse. So they wanted to know why, what was happening. So we looked at 150 of the organizations and we interviewed 60 of them individually to really learn what they thought about was going on in their own organizations. And we asked them these three questions. Are you capitalized to achieve your mission? Do your leaders understand the relationship between capitalization and mission? Is that evident in your actions? Can you see what's happening in everyday work by the long-term capitalization of your organization? And is the system helping or hurting in helping you capitalize your organization? So first we had to start with saying, what is capitalization? <laughs> what does that mean? And really what that is is the accumulation of your assets over time that you can apply to your mission. What, what are the dollars that you have that you've accumulated over all the history of your organization that you can apply? What resources do you have? Everybody needs three kinds of baseline capitalization. Everybody needs some working capital, everybody needs some reserves, and everybody needs some risk capital, the money that you need to start new projects, to start new ideas, to test things. Some people need endowment because they have a long-term view of, of where they belong in the community and they need that stabilization. And some people need plant reserves because they have a building and that building costs real money. So how would we know capitalization when we saw it? We would look for these things in people's balance sheets. And why did we care? Why did the funders care that we used this lens to look? We believe that poor capitalization is a risk to your mission. What we've been talking about for a long time in the, art, in, in the performing arts world is the following. We're worried about not making payroll. We're worrying about collection calls. We're worried about credit lines. We're worried about the fact that maybe we're overspending our endowment or we can't fix the roof. We're worried that you know, we don't seem to be able to do those things. We spend a lot of time talking about those things, but we don't spend a lot of time talking about what's really underlying that problem. What's underlying that problem when you can't pay your bills or you don't have enough cash is that you can't attract the talent or the artists or the people you need to do the work of the mission. It's your mission that's at risk. You can't create the innovative products, the new things that you need to do in real time to do it. You cannot find sustainability. So while we talk about the symptoms, what we're worried about is the mission risk. We're worried that you can't do the very thing that you were created to do. And that's why this lens was important. So, what did we find? <laughs> we found that over 75% of the groups we looked at, 150 groups in over a three year time period, pre-recession, pre-recession had highly constrained capital structures. And those that who were in a capital campaign to expand were the weakest of all. So the people who were least prepared to expand had the worst balance sheets were the ones in capital campaigns. It's a little scary. <laughs> On average, we found that people only had working capital. We devised a series of ratios. If you read our big report we did, in the back, there's this two-page analysis of all these ratios we did. We can test this, we can test that, we can look at these ratios, that ratio. We used one. We used one. Because there was only working capital. Nobody else had any money. And on average, working capital was a week. A week of operations. 
It didn't matter if you were big or small. It didn't matter what discipline you were in. It was uniformly bad. What is most upsetting is that the largest institutions were actually the worst. There was no shelter in being large. And in fact, the needs were deeper. So this was a wake up call for the funders in Philadelphia. These original findings shocked people. And in fact, we did not act, we created scores for all these organizations. We did not publish those scores because people were too afraid to look at the numbers in a public. To talk to Jesse's point about being honest, people didn't want to be that honest. <laughs> so we talked about it in general. So what we got to was most people were not well capitalized. Here's the second thing we really talked about. <laughs> there was an assumption that the reason that people are not well capitalized is because organizational leadership doesn't know that it needs to be. Funders entered the game, consultants entered the game thinking, that's what it is. You just don't know. <laughs> that's actually not true. In our 60 interviews, 58 people could, could expl completely explain their financial condition. They knew exactly where they were. They could tell us in great detail the pain they were experiencing. They could tell us how they were experiencing it. They could tell us how many days of cash they had. They could tell us why they were overspending on the endowment. They could tell us why they, their capital campaigns were not going to fix their actual problems. And the people who were in these capital campaigns who were in great distress could come right out and say, this capital campaign is going to make my situation worse. I know it. So it's not about knowledge. People know. You all know. Every single one of you, I'm about to tell you about how to read a balance sheet. You might not know the fancy parts of balance sheets. Every one of you know what your cash condition is. What we learned was there are no incentives in the system to talk about this. People can talk about the poor, um, uh, corrosive effects of it, but they have no venue to talk about it. They feel powerless to talk about it. Who would I talk about it to? Can I talk about it with my board? They don't want to hear it. They just want me to break even. Can I talk about it with my funders? They just want me to hit my campaign goal. If I talk about this, it's not going to feel good. So it wasn't knowledge. It was definitely something about the system. So we dug deeper. And we said, really, what are all the pieces that are happening here? And here's what we learned. In Philadelphia, there is a great mandate that all, foundation, all foundations have to make sure that everybody has a three-year rolling strategic plan. So lack of planning can't be part of the issue. That's what we thought when we started. Everybody has to have a plan. You can't get funding without a plan. You can't be in our sample without a plan. Hmm. So maybe planning doesn't help. But when we really dug in, and what we learned is a lot of the planning was internally focused. And we'll talk to you in a minute about what that means. Then we also learned that technical assistance abounded. Everybody had it. Everybody in our sample set had it and had lots of it. Hmm, maybe that doesn't work. Because maybe it does and that everybody has knowledge, but nobody could do anything about it. So why is that happening? And then as I alluded to before, the incentives were really completely misaligned between funders and the larger goals of capitalization. People who were giving the very money goals for what they were trying to accomplish were not actually aligned with capitalization, even though that's what they wanted to talk about. So let's talk about each of those. OK, planning was not contextualized. So everybody had them. But there were a lot of internal conversations about what they wanted to do untested by market realities. And if there were tests of market realities, they were benchmarks. So this is the, Jesse's going to talk about term limits. I'm going to talk about benchmarking. Benchmarking offers false information. It does not allow you to live in your community looking at your data, looking at your audiences, looking at what your community can do or wants to do with you as you move forward. It tells you about other people's communities. Not helpful. 
You have to live in your own community. You have to understand your own data. So when we did see data, it was about benchmarking. And the other thing I would say about benchmarking, the first thing I teach my associates when they come out of um, MBA school, and they come in, they have all these little benchmarks they want to show me about how something should work. I always say, hmm, so did you pull the financials on those benchmarks? Did you look and see if they were actually financially healthy? Did you look and see if they had impact? Did they have higher audiences? Did they have better numbers? What are you benchmarking? Are you benchmarking the average, the lowest common denominator, or success? So benchmarks are not helpful. That's number one. Number two is many people had created projections based on what they wanted to happen, what they wanted to aim for, rather than what they could do. And that was problematic for many people. And they told us, we don't know how to ground our projections in reality. We haven't tested real price, real cost, real investment strategies. There wasn't a real thinking about how we would do that. So planning was not fully contextualized. It was an accident, but it what didn't, hadn't really worked. Financial TA was not integrated. <laughs> this was a nice wake-up call for people like me. Um, in fact, I actually have lived this. You go into an organization and you tell them, hmm, you have a terrible balance sheet, you're out of cash. And as many people I interviewed said, so yeah, I know that, now what? <laughs> now what? Financial, financial TA given to organizations, and many of these people had it, many of you have probably gotten it this way, unattached to your strategy, unattached to what you're trying to do, standing alone gives you nothing to do. It gives you no way to act. So what we found is of the 60 people who had, retained, had financial TA, two had done anything with it. Everybody else put it away because it was not integrated back into what they were trying to accomplish. So the ex having financial TA alone, this was very revelatory to funders. We made them really think what they're investing in. But here's the part the funders own, and they own it big. Most incentives that funders give us are geared towards break-even budgets and isolated projects. Neither of these have the long-term thinking that's required for organizations to thrive and be well capitalized. Organizations get project grants that don't pay for everything, don't drop to the bottom line, don't do anything to advance the mission, sometimes pull you off mission, taking up what few resources you have away. And your, the reward in the system is for break even. You're good, you broke even. No one asked you for anything else. One of the things these two funders understood is that they held people accountable for broke, break even, but they did not hold them accountable for surpluses. People do what they're held accountable for. It's hard enough to do that. As Jesse has just told you, it's hard enough to break even. So not being held accountable for something greater was really hard. This was a huge lesson to the group we were working with. And a little later on, I'll tell you, it was a huge lesson when we took it to a wider group of funders at grant makers in the arts who had very revelatory moments when we said, it's your investment behavior that's creating the very situation that you don't want. So here's the other part of that conversation. Universally, in our interviews, we've heard, and in my practice, I've heard, I can't tell people the truth. I can't tell funders what I really need, because if I do, I will look weak, unrealistic, unfundable, so I'm not gonna tell you. And at some level, managers have the same conversation with their boards. I'm not gonna say what it really costs, they don't wanna hear it. So we have created a whole set of systems that while we say financial sustainability is what we want and what we need, boards say it, funders say it, we say it, but we don't have any way to talk about it and align those incentives. So this puts organizations in a double bind. I put this quote from one of, a person who runs a theater in Philadelphia above my desk and I think about it all the time. I feel as if the art world is at a critical moment where we need to take some real risks. 
yet somehow there is an overall feeling that art groups need to be financially conservative. There is not much reward to taking risk unless you succeed every time, which of course is not the nature of risk. And yet many funders want you to succeed all the time. They want their money to make sure that it was perfect, that it worked out, and that's not how this is all going to play out, and that's not what capitalization is about. So we talked about that. So in the end, what we came to with a group of funders who, who sponsored this study was this. It's all about risk. How do we manage risk? How do we talk about risk? How do we have the money to ameliorate the risks of economic downturns and changing environments? And how do we have the money to take the risk that we need to take to invest in our art, invest in our audiences, respond to external forces? And what happens if you can't? So this is where we left them. It was a really sobering moment, talk about sobering moments for folks in Philadelphia. Um, there were lots of conversations about this, about how we could change behavior and think about doing different things. And one of the things they asked us was, well, how would you help organizations achieve a capitalization strategy? What would you do? How would it work? How would you get a different set of conversations going amongst people? So, that's what we're going to talk about. Again, capitalization lives and is monitored in these buckets that we've been talking about. Working capital, operating reserves, risk capital, endowment, and plant reserves. But I would remind you as we go through this, there's another piece of capital that you all represent, and that's human capital. And what the, what the performing arts world has been doing really well over the last 20 years is bootstrapping on human capital and ignoring this capital. And so all the success that you have done has come on the cost of human capital. And I would argue that it can only take you so far in a changing environment. And so the human capital is rich. It's sitting in this room. What's poor in the sector is this kind of capital. Okay, so here's where we start. How well are you capitalized now? I always, when I go into an organization, I never look at P&Ls. Takes me a long time to get that far. I look at the balance sheet. It's your permanent record. <laughs> that one that you were all worried that you were carrying around, you are. It's the permanent record that shows all the history of your organization. It shows you your accumulated financial performance over time. It shows you how strong you are to face the future. It tells you how much cash you have to pay your bills. That's where we look. We start there. Then what we do is we say, okay, sitting in the balance sheet, what have you really got? Your P&L, your net income, drives to your net assets. If you make money, your net assets increase. If you lose money, your net assets decrease really pretty simple. But what's in those net assets? And here's where we fool around a lot with what we say we have. These, these pots of money are actually in order of reality. The top operating working capital and operating reserves, that's the money you need every day to get going and make the day happen. If you have money in plant, what you're calling plant reserves or restricted dollars and you have no working capital or operating reserve, you don't have any plant reserve or risk capital because you've got to pay the bills. You can't go double count the money. And what most people do is they double count the money. They say, we have a million dollars of X unrestricted, and it's all these things. It's a dessert topping. It's a floor wax. It's, it's not. <laughs> Each bucket has to represent its own bucket of money. And the first buckets of money are working capital and operating reserves because when you run out of money, it sucks everything else dry and takes it all down with you. So that's the first thing. The other thing that we have to think about is how we think about of endowment. Because there's restricted endowment and unrestricted endowment, and again, we're looking for cash coverage and receivable coverage on, the, on these pieces. Do you really have it? So we, have to, we want to start with everybody having honest conversations about what's in each of these buckets. Can you tie it? to your balance sheet. Can you show the cash for each of them? Do you really have it? And that's where we start. Then people want us to tell us right away, okay, we've done that, now we have our buckets. How much should be in the bucket? And here's where you all want me to say, 10% here, 3% here, two months here, four months there, and we can go home. That's not how it works. <laughs> there are absolutely no cookie cutter answers. 
each of your capitalization strategies is going to look slightly different. What needs to be in each of these buckets needs to reflect your reality, it needs to talk about what you need to do. There is no one right number. So your strategy determines the, the kind of funds it requires. And in order to do that, we have to look at your mission, your values, your program. What are your core business model drivers? What is your time horizon and life cycle? What's your marketplace? Where do you live? Only then can we figure out what are the necessary buckets of funds you need and where you're going to get them. So, oops, over advanced. Okay, mission and vision. This is starting to look like strategic planning, isn't it? That's because it is. <laughs> this is strategic planning. They are not separate things. You, so you need to start here. And I put this slide up because it seems like, of course, we would start here with our mission and vision. But I would push you to really think about this. Revisiting the core of what your mission and vision is, whether it's being inspired what Jesse said this morning or by inspired by the th very conversations you're all having, is critical. What are you trying to do and for whom? Answering that question matters most. And having everybody in your organization agree, critical. Where are we, where are we going? How are we getting there? Why, do we, why, why does it matter? Then we can start to think about other things. The next group of things we can think about are, what are your business model drivers? While every business has a multiplicity of drivers that are, again, unique to their own business, at the core, we would argue everybody has these drivers. Your audience, a facility if you have one, high fixed costs if you do. How you think about your capitalization depends on the mix that you have. So if you have only one major driver, like audience, then you have a lot of flexibility in how you approach the world. And you have a lower need for capital. The more drivers you add, the higher need for capital and the less amount of flexibility you have around these issues. So you have to think about that. How much, how much flexibility do I really have in my system? Then we have to think about your time horizon. I would say that when I've done this presentation before, this has been the hardest concept or the most controversial concept that we have put out there. We believe organizations have three basic time horizons. One is more the immediate or individual view. We would say that's an organization who really represents an individual artistic point of view. It could be a sole artistic point of view, but it's small, it's nimble. It may be here for 20 years, but it thinks in one or two or three year cycles. It has very little surrounding fixed costs. It's really about um, an individual's point of view. It happens usually to have a small budget. Not all, all not, it doesn't always work that way, but budget usually cor correlates that way. Medium term organizations are what we call brand identified organizations. I know what that organization is by its name. And its artistic direction can change, but it's being, that artistic direction is being hired to that brand. I know what that is. Blah, 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 Baroque. <laughs> it, I know what that is. And so those organizations probably have 30, 40 year time horizons. They have some level of fixed costs. They may or may not need a facility. They're in the middle. They have a lot of, of the uh, characteristics of long organizations. And their budgets tend to be anywhere from maybe a million and a half to maybe 15, 20 million dollars. Majority of organizations we think live in there. Then there are long-term view organizations. And these are organizations either because of their civic place or their need to steward assets in the larger arts world. These would be probably a lot of museums would be in this bucket. Who really need have a, what we ask is a 100-year vision. When I work with organizations, I always ask them, what is your long-term vision? And if you can say, I have a 100-year vision, then we think of you as this. So again, flexibility and capital intensity are living on this spectrum. If you're sitting in an individual view organization with a lot more flexibility, you, your capital intensity is much less. Your risk for not having large buckets of capital, much less. You're much more nimble. You can respond much more quickly to what's happening. You can be innovative faster and quicker. You can change what you're doing quicker. The more you, the, lo the longer term your time horizon is, the more you need money, the more you need capital. 
we checked in on some of the 150 organizations we looked at pre-recession to say, how are people doing post-recession? Here's what, here's while size and shape didn't matter pre-recession about where we were, post-recession, little, small, nimble organizations are doing far better than medium-term, long-term organizations. Because when the lack of capital happened during the recession, med medium-term and long-term organizations didn't have the capital and couldn't respond fast enough. So their cuts were deeper, their, shrink, their percentage of shrinking was deeper, the hurt was deeper. Smaller organizations, even though they didn't have as much capital, there wasn't as much to risk. They were able to do it much faster. The other thing I would say is, sometimes when people look at this chart, they think of it as, as an aspirational chart. I know, we'll start out with the individual view and we'll get to the long-term view. This is not an aspirational chart. This is about knowing who you are. The next piece we need to think about is life cycle. Uh, one of the things that's really critical is for, uh, when we, in the need for capital is where are you in your life cycle? If you're starting up growing, declining or renewing, in any of these critical moments of inflection, the simplest way I can say this is you need huge pots of cash. So it's antithetical to think we're going to shrink and get better without huge pots of cash. Shrinking defines the amount of cash you need, but doesn't need, take away the need for huge pots of cash. So you have to think, am I in one of these moments of inflection in my organization? If so, I need some cash. Okay, so here's the importance of the marketplace. A thorough understanding tests your mission and, and makes you go back and say, can I accomplish it? And it really is definition of audience, demand pricing, support, and competition. Here's two facts that I think are important for people to think about as, as you go through this marketplace. In the 60s, the U.S. Census determined what was the average household spend as a percentage of budget, household budget, on entertainment. That percentage has not changed since 1964. Yet, the definition of what's in entertainment, the bucket that is called entertainment, has increased fivefold. So people are not spending any more money, but their choices are fivefold greater. And what we also know is during that same period of time, nonprofit off offerings in mature marketplaces across the country have increased threefold. And they have outpaced population growth in mature cities. So you need to understand that people have more choices on a per capita basis than they've ever had before. Understanding in your own marketplace what those choices are, as opposed to what the national choices are, what the price points are, what the offerings are, what the niches are, critical. You have to understand your own lens. And we really do think that that speaks to the funding environment as well, when we talk about audiences, as well as we think about it as the actual audience itself. We have the privilege of going around to a lot of different cities. Every funding ecology is different. Some places are driven by foundations, some places are dri driven by individual donors, some people are driven by corporations, some it's a mix, sometimes government takes the lead. Understanding your own ecology is really critical here. Hmm, that's interesting, okay. <laughs> the other piece that you need to think about in, in the, uh, is what are the resources it's gonna take? What is the cost of really doing business? You know, really, on the local basis, what should talent, the fixed costs, and marketing and development investments be, given what you've learned about the marketplace? And for those with buildings, you have to really think about how does that all come together to fund your long-term requirement of buildings. Okay, so now you have all these pieces. We talked to you about lack of contextualized planning. Here's what we've been really thinking about. Standard strategic planning kind of looks like these buttons floating around on the screen. People are really good about talking about mis mission and artistic vision. People are getting be better and smarter all the time about strategy. The market is something that people do talk about, but it's an, uh, often a discussion about we want the market to behave like this. 
<laughs> as opposed to this is how the market behaves. Um, and there's some talk about rolling through your budgets and some, you should have a budget that goes with this. It should look like, and it should break even. And then over in the corner, if we're doing a capital campaign, we talk about capitalization when we get to the capital campaign. We argue that, and this is a, this is a chart only a consultant can really love. <laughs> but we think that this all needs to be integrated and holistic. You need to look at your time horizon, your business drivers, where you are in your life cycle. You need to lay that over your mission and vision, where you stand in the market, what are the resources you need. Look at all that data and come up with an integrated strategy that looks at your programmatic approach, your organizational approach, and your capitalization strategy. It's integrated. Talking about money and strategy separately only happens in the nonprofit world. Microsoft would never think about that. <laughs> Nobody who innovates would think about that. People who innovate build money. They build real money. The risk capital in this sector comes in the most horrifying way. Risk capital comes in grants because we haven't built it. So the way you all get risk capital is you go out and get a grant. Here's what happens. A bunch of smart people get in the room. You've done this. You've looked at your market. You've had really interesting thoughts. You're really smart. You actually know what to do. You have a great idea. So you, what do you do? You write a grant. A year and a half later, you try to implement it. The market moved. The reason you failed was probably you didn't get enough money, but you also had the market move on you. And you've got new lessons. The risk capital strategies are all unaligned. So you you've, are behind the eight ball the moment you start. Risk capital that comes a year and a half later is too late. <laughs> it's too late. And so when you don't have your own money to risk and think and pilot and test and then maybe go get larger investment dollars, you've really created a situation that doesn't allow you to do the very thing you all want to do. So, now we get to the part about size. <laughs> so, in every case here, what we say is when you look at what you need, first you size the need against everything we just talked about. So for operating and working capital and your reserves, you, looked at, you look at your fixed costs and, and your fixed costs of talent and the predictability of your actual revenue streams and you figure out the delta. This money should come from surplus pluses in your budget. You need to feed your own working capital and uh, operating reserves dollars. That needs to happen over time. This doesn't happen overnight, but this money needs to come from you. You need to generate surpluses. You need to figure out how your budget can do that. Risk capital happens when you look at how do you think about innovation? How important is innovation? What would a pilot program look like? At any given time, how much money should I have in my balance sheet that I could actually apply to something that I may not be able to pay myself back on right away? How would I do that? How could I have enough money in my balance sheet that it would be okay to do that? Well, you couldn't have it if you hadn't had the first ones already put away. Same thing with plant reserve. Those dollars, too, should start to come from your own operations. But we all know you're starting from a tough place. So you need to have conversations with the people who fund you about seeding some of these dollars. How do we get these dollars in there? And then endowment really is about what, what your business model is and what kind of endowment you really need. And that really, of course, does necessitate long-term fundraising and how you would think about it. So that's how you think about getting all these dollars put together. So you can do this. As I said to you in the very beginning, the smartest people I know in the arts are the people who run the arts organizations. They actually, everything I've just told you, I'm sure you know. But it's about ta making a commitment to actually thinking about it and how to do it. There are tools to do it. There are lots of folks who can help. But people like me, we can only help you to a point. This is really about what do you want to do? What commitments do you want to make? You're in the driver's seat. Your capitalization strategy should follow your strategy. This is about taking ownership of your own numbers. And the process really matters. 
Gathering data and making strategic decisions needs to be a very inclusive process. It requires the full engagement of the board up front. People I know who have actually thought about long-term capitalization in their organizations and have changed their capital structure to support their mission and to support their long-term goals have made this a commitment of the entire organization. It has been discussed ad infinitum at the board and it is part of the board monitoring process now. It's part of what the board asks of leadership. How are we doing on these things? Where are these dollars coming from? What do we care about? Um, and it's also a, a, all throughout the organization strategy as well. The whole organization needs to understand why these dollars matter. If you are trying to think about how to create an organization that creates surpluses, and you are realigning your organization to do that, there will be decisions you make that staff will not understand unless you can talk about why you're trying to get here and why this really matters. So you really have to get everybody committed. And as you all know, strategy can only be executed effectively if everybody is working together. Here's the next tricky piece. External support is essential. The best strategy in the world doesn't have the support of your funders and donors and audiences, doesn't matter. So, getting people on board with how you're thinking about capitalizing your organization and how it fits with your strategy, strategy key. Um, as I said to you earlier, we are living in the land of misaligned incentives. And we, have, we are complicit in that conversation. We do not tell people what we need. We do not force the issue. We do not make it understood. If you want great out impacts and great outcomes, they cost money. On the flip side, we have to be ready to hear that what your idea is or what you want to do is not worthy of getting money. This is a two-way conversation. But it has to change and you have to take responsibility for, wanting, for, for starting that conversation. And planning is a great way to do it. Because there is a real chance that external fund people won't understand. We have given the, uh, some version of this talk to many funders around the country. Um, there are still funders who believe that if you have a surplus, you don't need support. And we understand that that's somehow a conversation that needs to change. And that people need to have that in conversation in a really direct way. That in fact, organizations that are delivering high quality and a surplus are most worthy of support. And so that conversation is something that funders are starting to have with themselves. They want to see that that is something that makes sense to them. And we've been able to say, if we can show organizations can invest in themselves, they can do better, their missions are less at risk, they're going to do the thing you want, which is produce the art that you want to invest in, you're starting to see that, that perhaps that's a good way to go. But there are a le whole level of very sophisticated funders across the country who I would tell you are engaging in the much more sophisticated conversation, which is we have been investing in the arts for 20, 30 years, and our outcomes are not good. We're not happy. How can we change it? And they are taking ownership for changing the conversation, and they do realize that they've been part of the problem. And so they are looking to have this conversation with you. And so I would encourage you to find national funders who are talking about this and thinking about this and have them support your efforts. Um, there are things to happen, that are happening right now in the world of funding that can make you really help you think about this. So I encourage you to all think about this capitalization idea. Um, there has never been a, mo more mo a moment of greater inflection in the last 30 years in the arts than there is right now. Generational shift change in the way we at operate, all the things Jesse just talked about you. And it's going to take all the talent, leadership, the ability to risk, and capital to accomplish that change. So thank you very much, and I appreciate the time.